In this video, we're going to be walking you through everything that you need to know when post-processing a 2D drone map using Drone Deploy. You will learn how to upload captured images, analyze the data, download deliverables, and much, much more. So whether you are a drone mapping professional or just getting started, this video will provide an information-rich yet easy to understand deep dive into all things processing for your 2D drone maps. Right now, I'm here at an active construction site where my company, The Drone Life, has been contracted to fly the site bi-weekly until the building is complete. We are creating progress updates and 2D maps for the client, which allows them to develop better documentation records, inform stakeholders, and plan for the upcoming phases of the project. Uh, so what do you say? Let's get started in flying our 2D drone map of the site. Okay, so here we have our flight plan set up and you can see that I've mapped out the paths. We want the drone to fly and capture images, as well as inputting all the correct uh, settings for flying this mission. And in this video, I'm not going to specifically show how to flight plan and fly the site, as today we're really focusing on the post-processing side of the mapping workflow. But if you are looking for a walkthrough on how to fly the mapping mission, we have a previously made and very comprehensive video covering this topic, which you can view by clicking the card at the top of the screen or by clicking the link in the video description. And to provide some context, the flight planning and post-processing software that you will be seeing me use throughout this entire video is called Drone Deploy. Now they are an industry leading drone software company with a variety of possibilities beyond just 2D maps which I will get into a bit later when we head back to the office. Uh, but for now, let's perform our flight checklist and make sure everything is good to go and get started flying. As we are flying here, I did want to mention the importance of using high quality SD cards when doing these drone maps. Um, as hundreds or thousands of images will be taken at frequent intervals, you need something with a high write speed to avoid any missing images within your map due to the long uh, loading times of lesser quality SD cards. And just remember that all of your hard work and potentially hours of flying time is all right here on this li little card. Uh, so you would not want something to go wrong on a cheap card, uh, causing all the data to get corrupted, for example. So if you are wondering exactly what kind of SD card would be the best for the application of drone mapping, I will put a link in the video description of the exact SD card that I prefer when doing my drone maps, uh, so you can pick up one for yourself. Okay, now we are nearing the end of our flight, and you can see at the top here just how many images and how much time this map took us to fly. And I did actually switch batteries two different times as well, so we are currently on our third battery. And with that, we are about to finish up right now. So at this point, I'm going to take manual control of the drone and then fly it back to our location. And I am prompted with this message to upload the images on a computer from the SD card. Now there are two different options to upload our images. Right now we only see the one right here, which is referred to as upload later, where we will remove the drone's SD card and then plug into our computer to upload the images for processing. You will need an internet connection for the upload process, but it does not mean you have to wait until you get back at the office as you can still use your laptop out here in the field if you have a strong cellular connection or hotspot. 
The SD card upload is the most common method that the majority of you watching will perform, uh, but the other option not listed here is called mobile upload. The reason that we do not have the selection is because our map was over 1,000 images, and we also swapped batteries. Uh, so on smaller sized maps, where, where we would have under 1,000 images and complete the flight in just one battery, we will then be given the option for the mobile upload. And to demonstrate how the mobile upload does work, I'm going to quickly fly a, a, another map of this site at a higher altitude with a lot less overlap between my images. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I just finished our smaller map and we can now see the option here for the mobile upload. Basically, the mobile upload allows you to upload your data from the field directly to drone deploy to begin processing your map immediately without the need to wait until you're back at the office or even bother with the SD cards. The mobile upload process occurs in two steps. First, your images are transferred from the drone to your mobile device and then second, the images are uploaded from your mobile device to Drone Deploy. At this time, the mobile upload feature is only supported on iOS devices, and they at least require two gigabytes of free space on that device. And I'll list on the screen the current lineup of drone models where mobile upload is supported. Uh, these, of course, might increase in the future. Your drone also needs to have at least a 30% charge remaining to initiate the mobile transfer, now, I did just mention that you can't do uh, use this feature on multi-battery missions, but if your single battery mission is complete and you are just below or nearing that minimum a 30% charge limitation, you at this time can swap out for a new battery before you select the Upload Now button. The mobile upload feature is also not available if during your flight you selected a feature called Live Map where the map is instantly shown on your screen as the drone is flying. Additionally, mobile upload can only support up to 1,000 images and nothing over that. And although it's unlikely that you would do this, I did want to mention that Drone Deploy recommends to not update your app during the upload process as it will cancel the mobile upload from occurring. Okay, so now that all those disclaimers are finally out of the way, we can now select the Upload Now button. Now the images will begin transferring from the drone to your mobile device. Uh, this is step one of the upload process. Uh, please be sure to leave the, the drone and controller on, keep the Drone Deploy app open, and do not disconnect your USB cable. Once the images are successfully transferred to your mobile device, they will automatically begin uploading to Drone Deploy, and this is step two of the upload process. Now you will need a Wi-Fi connection at this step, a cellular connection on the device, or even use a hotspot, which is what I do. And the drone and controller can be turned off for this upload. Uh, you can also select pause and resume later if you do not have internet connection right now, or if you do not have time to complete the upload process. But again, please leave the app open to allow the uploading to occur. And as soon as the images are successfully uploaded to the cloud, the map will begin processing and you can now exit the app if you so wish. And although we did just upload the photos, it is still recommended to keep your original images on the SD card or even better, a copy them on a computer or external hard drive just in case. So in summary, the mobile upload is a great option for teams who want the map that same day or as soon as possible. Even if you are far away from your office, you can remotely upload your map photos to begin its processing process, while someone else who is currently at the office uh, can review and share the data for you once it is ready. And that pretty much covers the mobile upload feature. 
So how about we head back to the office now to demonstrate the upload later option that I did talk about earlier and continue our deep dive into the post-processing workflow of our newly created 2D drone map. Okay, so we are now back here at the office and the first thing that we were going to do is plug in our SD card into the computer and then log into our Drone Deploy account. And if you don't currently have a Drone Deploy account but are interested in creating and uploading your own map to test out the software, Drone Deploy does have a two week free trial available. You can sign up risk free without the need to input any credit card information. All they will ask is for your name, your email, and a, and a few questions about what you plan to use your account for. And then once you click submit, you will have immediate access to the software. So if you want to sign up right now, I will put a link in the video description. Okay, so right here on the projects page, we can see our different flight plans. And let's click on the one for the site that we just flew. And now we can see our flight plan here. And what we have to do next is go to the top of the screen and click upload. And you will find two different options for uploading our photos. First is the legacy uploader, which has been the standard for a long time. Uh, but just recently, Drone Deploy has announced a new upload option, which is currently in beta called Smart Uploader. But before we start the upload, let's cover a few requirements when uploading. First being that Google Chrome is the recommended browser for uploading your images, as Internet Explorer may not allow you to upload images and Safari may lead to degraded performance. You should also only upload one dataset at a time. Uh, so for example, if you had flown multiple maps throughout the day on different sites, you should not try and upload these image data sets using multiple tabs on your computer at the same time, as this may cause errors in the back end. Additionally, all images should be in JPG format and have metadata including latitude, longitude, and altitude in the GPS EXIF data. All images should also be facing the area of interest and have sufficient overlap of at least 70% and you need to have at least 10 images to process a reliable map. It is recommended to only upload the raw images straight from the SD card and not attempt to bring them into a third party editing software beforehand, as this may affect the metadata of your photos. You should also not upload data from two different dates due to lighting and environmental factors. Uh, for example, if you flew half of a site one day and the other half the next. Please do not do this. Okay, so let's now cover the process for the legacy uploader. The first thing that we're going to do is click the button and then select what kind of data set that we were trying to create. We were doing a 2D map, so let's click on create a map or model. Now click on the select photos button and find your SD card and the folder where your files are stored. Of course, I'm currently using a Mac, so these windows will look different if you have a PC. And for simplicity's sake, make sure that your folder only has files from your, from your mapping flight and not from previous flights from other projects. Okay, so if you took over 1,000 images during your flight, you may have multiple folders, with each folder holding 999 images. Now, if you do have multiple folders of images, please do not combine the files into one folder. So when images are captured on DJI dr drones, they automatically restart image naming schemes after 1,000 images. Uh, this means that larger flights with over 1,000 images captured will have file names ranging from DJI underscore 001 to DJI underscore 999, and then back to DJI underscore 001. Images with the same name when uploaded together will be considered duplicates. So in order to avoid this, you must upload one folder at a time by opening it and selecting all the pictures. Or if you really want to combine into one folder and rename all the images to avoid duplicates, there are ways to do this in large batches on Mac and Windows, uh, but today, let's keep it simple and upload one folder at a time. Okay, so you will see the images getting uploaded, and now just briefly wait until they are complete and click add so we can import the next batch.
And once you upload all your images, you will now see these little blue dots over the satellite photo, uh, with each of these actually being the location of where each image was taken. And now this blue outline around all the blue dots is called the upload boundary. It allows you to crop the area that you're looking to process. Uh, say for example, you only wanted to process a certain area of the map. You can move this around to eliminate spe uh, specific sections. Uh, but today we want to process the entire map. Uh, so let's just move the boundary back. You can also click on each image to open the image review window. Here you can actually deselect images that you may not want to include in the processing, uh, such as ones that are blurry, overexposed, underexposed, or maybe images that you accidentally uploaded. If you select this magnifying glass on an individual image, you can then view its metadata, such as the ISO, shutter, aperture, and focal settings, along with some more general information, such as the flight altitude and the date that the photo was taken. Here we also have the option to add GCPs or ground control points. These are without a doubt an essential component for achieving the highest possible accuracy of your map. However, we won't be covering the entire workflow for using GCPs in this video, as that topic definitely deserves its own dedicated video. But if you do want to learn more about GCPs and their role in drone mapping, we have a very comprehensive article that covers the most common questions that we do receive, as well as our top picks for the best ground control points available for sale in the market. So I highly recommend you go check that article out. I will put a link in the video description. The next option is Turbo Upload. This is meant for those who have limited internet access, as Turbo Upload compresses the files within your dataset for optimized uploading. Enabling Turbo Upload means that your upload will be up to 10 times faster, but your map will be, will be about half the resolution compared to a standard upload. And the processing time estimates will show the minimum expected time range and the maximum expected time range based on historical data from drone deploys, uh, hundreds of thousands of maps that they have created. And the variance in times is because uh, the time it takes to stitch a map together really does depend on the subject matter and how easy it is to find unique features across all the images. Okay, so once everything is ready to go, we will press the upload images button and then you can view the image upload progress and please keep your tab open during this stage. And while we wait for the images to be uploaded, if you are enjoying the video so far, please consider giving it a thumbs up as it really does help, help us make more educational videos like this in the future. Okay, and once the upload is complete, the data processing will automatically begin and then you will receive this success message. If you now look at your dashboard, you will see the processing status of your map and please be advised that the processing for a high quality data set can take several hours. Uh, on average, the processing time takes around one minute per image. And once the processing is complete, you will receive an email notification uh, to the email address that you have with your account. So that was the legacy uploader method, but has Dronaplay made the workflow even easier with their new smart uploader? Let's find out. So basically the smart uploader is an algorithm that takes your complete data set and then automatically sorts it into the appropriate plans for upload and processing in Dronaplay. Say for example, you're making multiple types of data sets like progress reports, 2D maps, and panoramas all at the same time. Uh, this feature can actually take all the files on the SD card and organize them into the appropriate data plan. Of course, right now we are only uploading files from our 2D map project, uh, so there won't be any sorting required, uh, but this feature is truly a first of its kind, and I highly recommend you try it out uh, once you start creating multiple types of data sets. So getting started here, we will click on the Smart Uploader button, and just like before, we're going to add our images one folder at a time. And once we have everything uploaded, you can see this row appear. Now we can click on the row and view our images and dots on the map. And this time we have a few different options for deselecting our images. 
uh, we can deselect an image in the portfolio view or we can go onto the map and actually click on a specific dot to deselect that image. And again, we have the option to add ground control points right here. And once we are ready, we will click on start upload to begin the upload process. There are a few considerations to keep in mind if you have a very large map data set. One being that Droneaploy can only support data set uploads up to 10,000 images, which means that each map is limited to 10,000 photos. However, there can be exceptions to this rule, and if you ever have a specific project where you really need to upload over 10,000 photos, you'll want to reach out to Droneaploy's support team so they can better assist you further. It is important to note that datasets of this size can take a very long time to process and complete. And to avoid days of potential processing time, you may want to consider uploading your images in smaller chunks instead of all at once. For example, on a 10,000 image map, you can upload two separate times at 5,000 images each, or three times at 3,333 images. When you upload in these smaller chunks, it will increase your map resolution and provide faster processing times. And a bit later in this tutorial, I will, I will cover exactly how you would go about doing this by using the Add Additional Images feature. Additionally, you can not only create your own maps, but also upload existing ones via a GeoTIFF file. This allows you to host, view, and share 2D drone maps that have already been created through a different software program, or maybe a different individual who is outside of your organization. All you have to do is come down here in the panel where it states have an existing map and then you can upload your, your uh, GeoTIFF file and the map will begin to process. Just keep in mind that maps created using this method will not include elevation data. So certain features like volumetric measurements and 3D modeling and certain export types will not be available. Okay, so it's a bit later in the day and we got this email that our map is now ready to view. So let's go check it out. All right, so here is our completed map and it looks fantastic. Uh, so we can really zoom in here and see all the different details uh, throughout the site and browse around a bit. And then we can also zoom out to demonstrate the entire scale of, of the map that we just created. Now this bar on the right hand side is called the toolbox and there is a variety of tools to choose from. The first one being your pointer, which is selected now, so we can navigate around the map. Next, we have the location marker. You can grab it and place it on a point of interest on the map to get the coordinates, elevation, and images that captured in that location. You can also name it, color it, and even mark it as an issue. And we can add a summary over here or close the issue once resolved right here. And then we can choose a severity level of the issue and even input an estimated cost of repair. And finally, we were able to add additional comments about the issue and upload specific photos relating to it. The next tool that we have is the distance, which allows us to draw lines to see information regarding length, horizontal length, surface length, slope, and vertical height. We, we also have a chart to view elevation changes and the option to export a CSV file of the surface profile. And similar to the location marker, we can change the name, the color, and classify issues. Next up, we have the area tool. And with this, we can create a shape and receive an acre estimation. Uh, we can also adjust our shape further by clicking on the faded white dots and dragging them around. Or we can move the entire shape by holding and dragging the, the directional ar arrow at the bottom. The next tool is called the volume, which is primarily used for stockpile calculations uh, so if we go around and find a stockpile on our site, we can create a box around the pile. 
to receive information regarding the area, cut, fill, net volume, and material volume. Additionally, we can also classify what the material is so we can receive more precise calculations. And there's also the option to change the surface and base plane. You can also consider using this next tool, which is called Stockpile AI. Now this automatically detects stockpile parameters throughout the entire map and, and allows you to select them with a single click, which saves you a lot of time. Uh, currently, this feature is only available for enterprise level subscription tiers. I did want to mention that if you plan to do stockpile measurements using your drone maps, please keep in mind that there are more specific settings and procedures that you will need to learn and implement uh, during your flight and post-processing workflows, uh, like using ground control points. So in, in order to truly receive uh, the most accurate results, uh, these extra parameters are some things you really have to consider. Our next tool is for counting objects on your map. Uh, so whether it is trees, cars, or inventory, the counting tool is a simple way to keep track of objects throughout the entire site. All we have to do is place our dots on different points of interest. And if we did place one incorrectly, uh, just go click on the back arrow at the bottom corner of the screen. And once we have placed all of the markers, we can click on the checkbox down here. And now we can actually name the objects and be told the entire quantity. Next up is the radius. With this selection, we can actually click and drag a circle and then we will be provided with the coordinates of the location along with the area, radius, and perimeter. And we can reduce or increase the circle size by clicking and dragging the outer white dot. And the last option that we do have here is just a shortcut method uh, for the location marker and the aerial tool uh, when classifying issues around the site. Uh, so we can just place each of these and then have the immediate option to label issues. So as we can see, our map has a variety of different tools that we have scattered around all over the site. And each of these edits are actually called annotations. And there is an easy way to or organize and view every annotation that you put down. Uh, so if we come over here to the main panel and click annotations, uh, we can then see each tool that we placed on the map. And under the annotations tab, we can see each issue that we classified on the map as well. Moving towards the top of the panel, we can see the option to add layers. Now there is a variety of different layers that we can add on, on the map. Uh, for example, adding design plans as an overlay to allow you to quickly check progress against the drawings. You can also add grading uh, versus actual elevation, uh, spotting health and safety issues, planning delivery routes, and much more. The next layer is plant health. So this layer is specifically targeted towards agricultural applications, and you are able to adjust the contrast to highlight variability within a field using the slider, so you can quantify damage and predict yields by showing the area within a specific range. You can also change filters or select an algorithm that is best suited for your crop, and you can toggle grids, zones, or change opacity. If you are in agriculture and are planning on using drone maps for your fields, I do highly recommend you look more into Drone Deploy's Precision Agriculture Package, which is a more tailored software for your use case. And the last layer that we have is the elevation. Now this allows you to view the elevation of your map by using either a digital surface model, DSM, or a digital terrain model, DTM. The elevation data is derived from geospatial information embedded in your images and is automatically generated when you process your imagery into a map. Uh, by default, the elevation information is expressed in the WGS84 Global Reference System. Of course, different spatial reference systems are available. In the panel, we can use the slider to adjust the contrast between elevations, and doing so 
We'll also update the acreage numbers above uh, for the sections of the map that fall within those ranges. By default, we are viewing the Digital Surface Model DSM. Additionally, we can select the Terrain Only toggle if we want to view the map Digital Terrain Model or DTM instead. Keep in mind that Digital Terrain Model Viewing is currently only available for individual and enterprise subscription tiers. Now going to our media, we can check the box and see our blue dots appear again uh, throughout the map, which shows all the images that were taken. Each one can be clicked on and enlarged, and then we can receive information about the camera settings, the date the photo was taken, among other things. Going into our map details at the top, we have the option to rename our map, and then, and then it states the date from which the photo capture took place and the option to add more images. Now, after uploading your images and processing your map, there may be times when you want to upload additional images, whether it is because you overlooked a folder of photos when uploading, uh, you split up your uploads on a large map data set for faster processing, or there are additional portions of the site that you missed when flying. All of these reasons and more or examples of when you'd want to add additional images to your existing map without having to process an entirely new one. So what you have to do is press the add more images button so you can then upload more photos. Now let's review the boundary line to ensure that it includes the entire expected processing area before submitting the new images. Okay, so it all looks good, and we are going to upload the images. And just like before, I'll look out for that email notification alerting you when your new map is ready. Now back to the map details tab, we have the toggle for opacity, which turns the map on and off. And then we have the base map opacity, which will turn off the surrounding satellite imagery. Next, we are given the map area and acres, of course, these values can be switched from the Imperial to the metric system in your account settings. Then we have a few tools, the first one being a calibration marker. So basically, the elevation maps within Drone Deploy are created using standard geo-referenced information embedded in your drone imagery. The elevation data displayed is the absolute elevation in the, in the WGS84 format. However, when we are using the absolute altitude from the drone's GPS, there is room for significant variation in elevation values. This is because DJI drones blend the GPS elevation with the barometric pressure to get an estimate of the altitude. This means that if there are temperature differences, then the drone will register a different absolute elevation. To correct this error or to view your elevation data in a different ellipsoid, you can use elevation calibration to enter a known elevation at a point on the site to correct the elevation within your map. So let's drag the calibration icon to a point on the map where we know the elevation. Uh, this could be a GPC marker, a takeoff point, or a different recognizable point or feature on the map uh, from which that we know the elevation. Then we will enter the elevation of the point and click calibrate and you will see a confirmation message at the bottom of the screen confirming that the elevation map has been updated. Please note that all elevation data associated with the map will be adjusted using the difference between the default elevation and the entered calibrated elevation on that specific point. The results would be reflected in the elevation histograms, elevation visualizations, measurements, and exports. Our next tool is for cropping your map. So most of the time, you will notice around the edges of the map, it can become quite jagged and messy. So if you want to clean the, these areas up or exclude specific parts of your map that you don't need, uh, you can select the crop tool and outline your map the way that you'd like it. Once you're done, click the check mark at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to revert to your original map or make more adjustments, you can select the crop tool again to do so. Next up, we have the resolution that your map was captured in. Although several factors do affect the map resolution, 
it is most dependent on the quality of your images and the altitude of your flight. The resolution for this map is 0.5 inches per pixel. This means that half an inch is how much ground is covered in each pixel throughout the entire map. Uh, the, the technical term for this is called the GSD or ground sample distance. Next, we have aligned with previous map. So in mapping without ground control points, photogrammetry data relies on GPS for overall scale and alignment of the map with the earth. Often, this GPS data can be off up to a few meters, and so two maps of the same location, especially if captured on different days, will not align with each other in 3D space. Luckily, Drone Deploy does do this alignment automatically, so if you plan to fly the same site multiple times to track changes, or if you plan to import a drawing overlays, the automatic map alignment feature will make sure that your maps do line up together. And again, you can select the question mark for more info regarding this process. Okay, so moving down, we have the map accuracy. Now there are so many factors that can determine the accuracy of your map. So whether we are talking about relative or absolute accuracy, using checkpoints or ground control points, determining the ground sample distance, uh, using an RTK or PPK system, and much, much more. This is definitely a topic for its own video, but these kinds of factors really will determine how accurate your map is going to be. Uh, but for a comprehensive breakdown of your map's accuracy, uh, capture parameters and dataset coverage, here you can view the processing report. And once you click that link, a window will pop up with this PDF document. And I'll scroll through here so you can have a good idea of what is included. Finally, the last things that we have here is the flight ID, which is really just used if you need support from the drone deploy team and for certain integrations. Then we have the option to move your map to a different project and to permanently delete your map. Now, even though we did create a 2D map, we were actually still able to view the project in a 3D viewer if we so please uh, by selecting the cube icon at the bottom of the screen. And if your computer is powerful enough to handle it, which my MacBook definitely is not, then you can move the model around and toggle a lot of the features that we previously talked about, like the map photos, annotations, and even contours. And the L-shaped icon at the bottom of the screen next to the cube is a way to import floor plans of buildings for 360 degree virtual walkthroughs. Uh, so as you can see, Drone Deploy isn't just all drones. Uh, they really have solutions for a lot of different use cases. Now Drone Deploy also has a great option to download PDF reports of the different annotations that we created throughout the map. So if you go here to the top bar where it says reports, you can see which ones are available and all you have to do is click on view to explore the document. You'll have options to download a CSV file, print or save as a PDF, or share as an online viewing link. Okay, now your map is looking very good and you want to export some files. Luckily, this is a very straightforward process. Uh, so let's get started down here by clicking the export button in the panel. And this will bring up the export window. And first, you will select the file type that you need. And as you can see, there are a variety of options here. But please note that depending on your subscription tier, some of these export types may not be available. Okay, so let's go and choose one of these. Then you'll need the email addresses of those who will be receiving the exported files. This is a very similar workflow to earlier when we uploaded our map photos and waited for that email notification once our map was done processing. It's going to be the same process here with the deliverables. We will be sent an email link to download them. So you can input your own email if say only you need the deliverables or you can import uh, email addresses of the client or other stakeholders 
so they can directly receive the files. Next, we will move down to further categorize what file type we want to export. Okay, so once we selected the file that we need, we're going to move on to the map projection. Here there are different options to export your map using different coordinate systems or map projections. These projections determine how your data is projected from the 3D Earth to a flat computer screen. By default, most exports are generated using the Web Mercator Projection EPSG3857. It represents coordinates in meters from the Earth's center rather than from latitude and longitude. If you want to import your images into Google Earth or a different web viewer, you'll most often want to use this setting. If selected, you will also receive a KML file. Exports are also available in the most common global spherical coordinate system, the World Geodetic System, a WGS84 EPSG4326, which is the standard for all satellite navigation systems. It is useful if your third-party software is expecting latitude and longitude and elevation in meters. If you require a custom EPSG code, such as a state plane coordinate system, or Universal Transverse Mercator UTM, this is available to business and enterprise level accounts. And as you can see when scrolling through, there are a variety of options to choose from. Of course, these will automatically generate to the location of your map, as my project is here in New Jersey, so that's why I'm seeing so many of these local options. Certain data exports like GeoTIFF, Elevation, or Digital Terrain models We'll also have an additional option for single image or tiled. Uh, by default, the single image is checked, but it will ensure that you receive one image for the entire map. If you are concerned the map will be too large to process as a single image on your computer, you can then select the tiled box and you will receive the data as a set of tiles. That way you can load the tiles selectively in a way that is manageable for your setup. Lastly, we have the resolution. Here you can export your map at different resolution levels. The higher the resolution, the longer the export process will take and the larger the file size will be. Now, we just need to click on export and we will receive a confirmation message. And this is one file at a time. So let's go repeat this process again to request a different file. So let's go back into the export window and pick our file and add our email address and then select our projection and we're going to do single image and then let's make this this one a different uh, resolution and then let's submit for our deliverable keep in mind the export process is usually complete within a few minutes uh, but it may be longer for different file types and for very large maps okay so it's been a few minutes and here is the email that we did receive and just keep in mind that you'll receive a different email for every deliverable that you request. Now all we have to do is click on download and it will begin downloading to our computer. If your company is processing a lot of maps on a frequent basis, one feature that is worth mentioning is auto exports. So each and every time a new map completes processing within that project, an export under your chosen settings will automatically trigger without any action needed. This will save a lot of manual time from requesting standard exports and provides you with actionable data as quickly as possible. I won't be covering exactly how it works in this video, but you can check out Drone Deploy's documentation for more information if you are interested. So we just covered how to download files, but what if you are looking to share your online map link with other contractors, people in your company, or the end client, uh, so they can actually interact with the map within Drone Deploy's user interface. Well, this process is also very simple. We will come down here in the panel where it says share, and you will find three different user roles for sharing data within your project. You can share the entire project with a collaborator, allowing them to make edits, manage data, and user access. You can also add someone as an editor who can edit, create content, and share files. Or you can add someone as a viewer 
allowing the recipient to view and interact with the map without access to any of the different tools and layers. All we have to do is select the option that we want and then type in the recipient's email address and then click invite. Our recipient will receive an email notification inviting them to the project and once they click the link in the email, they will also see the project appear on their own dashboard. Please note that only recipients who have a Drone Deploy account can be added on a project via these roles. So if you're looking to share your map with a client who does not have a Drone Deploy account, you'll want to instead use the view only link. So the view only link is a great way to share your map with clients and stakeholders who want to see the newest data, but don't need to make any edits and don't want to create their own Drone Deploy account. To send someone a view only link, you'll want to click on the view only button to copy the link, and then you can paste that in an email to send to your contact. And if that person viewing the shared link is not logged into Drone Deploy, here is exactly what they would see when they are inside the project. It's a very basic view only version of the individual map that you shared. And they will also have the option to sign up or log into Drone Deploy as well. One caveat of the receiver viewing the shared link when not logged into a Drone Deploy account is that the units will default to meters. But if the recipient does log in, the units will then be default to what the sender has set for that project. So in summary, these sharing options are great for allowing others to make edits to the map, whether or not they are within your organization. But also, it's a great online viewing platform so the client or other contractors who don't need all the bells and whistles can easily see the data set, whether or not they are tech savvy or even have access to specialized software to view your deliverable files. So there you have it, everyone. That is how you post process a 2D drone map using Drone Deploy. And like I mentioned earlier, Drone Deploy does have a two week free trial available if you're interested in testing out the software for yourself. But anyway, if you have any questions, please feel free to directly message me on LinkedIn, or if you want to chat about having us come out and fly and post process uh, some drone maps on your project sites, then you can go on our website and set up a consultation call on thedronelifenj.com. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing and leaving a like or a comment. All of your generous support really does help us make more educational content like this in the future. So thanks again and fly safe.